so let's explore this generalized version of the Van der Waals equation a little more now that it's written in terms of these reduced pressure, reduced molar volume, and reduced temperature variables. See if we can understand how that could possibly tr be true about real gases that we no longer need to know their Van der Waals coefficients A and B in order to make predictions about their properties. And also this statement that the compressibility factor is equal to 3 eighths according to the Van der Waals equation for any gas at its own critical point where the, the pressure, vol molar volume, and temperature are equal to the critical properties or the reduced pressure, reduced molar volume, reduced temperature are all equal to one. So to see how that works, first let's pull up a graph of the uh, PV properties for a handful of gases. So here I'm not plotting pressure versus volume, I'm plotting the compressibility factor as a function of the pressure. So the compressibility factor, remember, that'll be equal to one when the gas is behaving perfectly ideally. If intermolecular attractions dominate, Z will be less than one. If the mo finite molecular volume dominates as it does at high pressures, then Z will be greater than one. So as you'd expect, these graphs look different for all sorts of different gases. So gases H2, N2, O2, methane, and CO2 all behave differently on this graph. Uh, they have varying degrees of non-ideality, again dominated perhaps by intermolecular interactions for the more strongly interacting gases like CO2, or dominated more by finite molecular volume for the more weakly interacting gases, especially at high pressure. So, um, but notice that as we go to, to low pressure, all these gases approach ideal behavior. So as regardless of whether it's a, a, a gas dominated up here by uh, finite volumes or by intermolecular interactions, at low enough pressures, they approach uh, ideal, and then they'll behave ideally at, at low pressures. So that's a little bit like uh, Tolstoy's famous quote that every uh, happy family is the same, but all unhappy families are unhappy in their own unique way. Every ideal gas behaves the same. Once it becomes non-ideal, it behaves non-ideal in its own sort of way. But that doesn't seem like it's what this generalized Van der Waals equation is predicting. So first, let's take a closer look at the critical point. So if I replace this graph with one showing the properties, again, compressibility factor as a function of pressure, but specifically not at 300 Kelvin anymore, but plotting each gas at its own critical temperature. So now we see the curves are still different, but they have begun to look a little bit more similar. So H2 here, the open squares, the compressibility factor drops uh, with increasing pressure until it goes through a minimum and then it starts increasing again uh, after it gets to this point. Each one of the gases has the same sort of behavior. It drops for a while and then begins increasing uh, after that. So the, the curves have a similar shape now. The reason they're not exactly identical to each other is because I've plotted them as a function of the actual pressure rather than the reduced pressure. So if I change the graph one more time and now plot for each gas not compressibility factor as a function of absolute pressure in atmospheres, but it's reduced pressure, pressure relative to the critical point, now you can see that they're all behaving, in fact, remarkably similar. They all go through the same sort of drop, go through a minimum very close to the critical pressure, and uh, begin increasing after that, and will eventually cross above Z equals one. So this is again, uh, actually this is a typo, that shouldn't say 300 Kelvin, that one should say uh, critical temperature. When we're at the critical temperature, all these gases behave the same when plotted as a function of their reduced pressure. So let's do this not just at the critical temperature. In fact, while we're on the critical temperature, let me point out that the, the critical compressibility factor, when I'm at the critical temperature somewhere on this isotherm and at the critical pressure, if I read up, the uh, compressibility factor is indeed very close to uh, 0.375 or 0.3 or something like that. So all the gases have the same critical compressibility factor or very close to it at the critical temperature and at the critical reduced pressure. Uh, <coughs> uh, okay, so now if I r w see how these gases behave not just at the critical temperature but at other temperatures as well, that'll be the next graph that we pull up. So now the same data we saw before at the critical temperature is here at a reduced temperature of 1.2, so 20% above the critical temperature, the, all of the gases are plotted on uh, the uh, points that fall near this line right here. At 50% above the critical temperature, they behave like this. 
twice the critical temperature, they behave like this. So you can see they're not all truly identical. Uh, which one is that? CO2 is a little bit uh, different than the rest of these. So, but uh, they're not actually truly identical to one another, but uh, the general idea behind this generalized equation of state is, seems to be holding pretty well, that all gases do behave fairly similarly, if not exactly the same, uh, when thought of in terms of their reduced pressure and their reduced temperature and their reduced molar volume. So that is a, a fairly remarkable statement. Uh, so, uh, uh, now we can um, move on to this next graph, which is uh, what we would use to make use of this idea and say, since we don't need to know the A and B quantities for a gas, we can plot these, these curves. Here's the curve for compressibility as a function of reduced pressure at the critical temperature, 10% above, 20% above, and so on. So it doesn't matter what gas we're interested in, this graph will describe the compressibility factor and therefore the PVT properties of that gas fairly well regardless of the identity of the gas. So just to get an example to see how that works, let's do a numerical example. Let's say we're interested in CO2. CO2 is a gas that has a fairly low critical temperature. In fact, it's often used to do supercritical, uh, uh, used as a supercritical solvent. So let's see, the critical temperature of CO2 is about 304 Kelvin. Its critical pressure is 72.8 atmospheres. So let's say I'm interested, so those are just properties of CO2. Let's say I'm interested in doing something at a temperature, let's use 350 Kelvin and a pressure of 100 atmosphere. And as with any gas or supercritical fluid calculation, we can predict one thermodynamic variable in terms of two others. So I could predict the molar volume as a function of P and T. One way to go about that would be to use the Van der Waals equation. We already know how to do that. But this generalized version of the Van der Waals equation and this generalized compressibility factor diagram gives us a different approach for doing that. So if I have the gas at 350 Kelvin, I can say the reduced temperature is going to be temperature over critical temperature. So temperature divided by critical temperature, 350 over 304.1. That works out to about 1.15, so 15% above the critical temperature. That tells me which of these isotherms I'm living on, the gas is living on. Likewise, the pressure, the reduced pressure is actual pressure divided by the critical pressure, 100 atmospheres over 72.8 atmospheres. And if I imagine that I know that to a few sig figs, we can calculate that ratio 100 divided by 72.8. That works out to be 37% above the critical pressure. So that's enough information for me to find where I am on this generalized compressibility diagram. So this is the critical isotherm, the isotherm at a reduced temperature of 1. This is the isotherm at a reduced temperature of 1.1. Here's 1.2. We're interested in 1.15. So that would be a curve that will be, we'll have to interpolate it in our minds but that would be a curve that is somewhere in between, roughly halfway between the 1.1 and the 1.2 curves. Likewise, the reduced pressure of 1.37, so here's, here's 1, here's 1.5, 1.4 is going to be roughly here, so I just need to read up from this point and find the location on this 1.15 isotherm, roughly right about there, and then read off on the volume axis what is the compressibility factor for a gas at this temperature and at this pressure. And if I tr try to do that fairly carefully, it looks like that's going to be fairly close to 0.65 or so, at least to my ability to read off of this diagram. So we predict that the compressibility factor, uh, let me write that where you can read it, 
is going to be z uh, is equal to 0 0.65 under these conditions. Compressibility factor, of course, is PV bar over RT. We know uh, what the pressure and the temperature are. We know what Z is. We just need to figure out what the molar volume is. So the molar volume is going to be Z RT over P. So 0.65 for the compressibility factor. R, if we have pressures in atmospheres, I'm going to use R in units of liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Also in the numerator, I've got a temperature of 350 Kelvin. So numerator multiplied by 350 Kelvin. In the denominator, divide by my pressure of 100 atmospheres. And just to double check the units, compressibility factors unitless, atmospheres, cancel atmospheres, Kelvin, cancel Kelvin. And I'm left with a liters over moles, which is good. That should be, in fact, it reminds me that I have a molar volume uh, that I'm calculating. My molar volume should work out in units of liters per mole. And if I plug these numbers into a calculator, what I find is that the result is 0.19 liters per mole. So if I did have supercritical carbon dioxide at a temperature of 350 Kelvin and 100 atmospheres, in other words, 15% above its critical temperature, 37% above its critical pressure, I can predict just graphically by reading off of this diagram that the molar volume is going to be roughly 0.19 liters per mole. Uh, that is much easier, uh, not quite as uh, precise as using the Van der Waals equation of state with as many sig figs as I know my uh, Van der Waals constants to, but most likely more accurate because these isotherms were obtained from empirical data from real uh, gas molecules uh, rather than uh, this Van der Waals equation model. So using this compressibility diagram is essentially a way of doing PVT calculations. You can calculate molar volume as a function of P and T or vice versa. You can calculate P as a function of V and T using this, this diagram and solve a problem graphically rather than algebraically. So uh, this general approach, as, as we've seen, that's very useful when I have temperatures and pressures that are typically quite a bit higher than the critical temperature. The, the critical, these isotherms are for temperatures at the critical temperature and above. Pressures, most of this diagram is covered by uh, larger than the critical pressure. These are conditions where we have either a very hot gas or a hot liquid or supercritical fluid. There's also interesting features of the phase behavior of gases down at colder temperatures, well below the critical temperature, in fact, below the temperatures that cause the substance to solidify into a solid. So that's what we'll do next is explore the, the portions of the phase diagram where we have solid phases.